الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا ما بعد We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى abundantly and we ask Allah to exalt the mention grant peace and send his salutations and his blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and may Allah exalt his mention, his companions, his wives, and all those who follow them on the path of righteousness until the day of recompense. Um, before I discuss the topic at hand, the resurrection, some people have a hard time reading it. I sent it to a few people, they were like, what is this word you have in the flyer? So uh, it's one of these complex, maybe English words, but before we go there, uh, I just want to share with you from a personal perspective that I am very honored to have my father-in-law uh, amongst the audience here. Uh, so he's a VVVIP. Uh, in case you don't know what that is, go to Sri Lanka. Uh, I remember riding a car that had on a sticker that said VVIP. And I told the driver, what is that supposed to mean? I know, you know, VIP. VVIP is more important than VIP. Because if this is the case, then some people have like 25 Vs before the IP, and then the IP will have some sort of connection problems, never mind. But anyway, so I think it should be always one V, <laughs> one V IP. Um, so thank you for being around. Uh, as for the lecture, the resurrection, of course when we say the resurrection, I might discuss possibly the uh, affairs of the last day, right? Because that's what comes to mind when you say resurrection, you might think of Jesus, from, from a Christian perspective, if you say the word resurrection, perhaps what comes to mind is Jesus. Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Of course, from an Islamic point of view, we don't believe he ever died to be resurrected. Therefore, that cannot be applicable. What, what comes to a Muslim's mind is not Jesus Christ, unless you give da'wah to Christians, in which case you will think that way. What comes to mind from an Islamic perspective is the last day. Meaning after everyone is dead and buried, however they wind up dying or whether there's a formal barrier or not, everyone will rise from the graves to the last day. And that would not be the topic of the lecture. Because we have discussed this previously. We have spoken about this uh, event in a number of lectures. We spoke about it in the minor signs, the major signs of the last day. The lecture six feet under, all alone. We spoke about this event. Uh, even in the description of paradise, eternal bliss, or the description of the hellfire, scorching hot, we address the issue of what happens at the end of time and how the people will seek intercession from who? Who will the people, the human beings, who will they seek intercession from? From everybody. They will seek intercession from every prophet. However, the only one who will be able to fulfill their request is the Prophet Muhammad. Alayhi salatu salam who will say, Ana laha, I am for this. He was, he was created and he was meant to be the only Prophet who will have this privilege on the last day. Not to undermine the other Prophets, but to show the status of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, versus the rest of the Prophets. That's why he, would, he led them in prayer. And that's why he has this special, uh, you know, position amongst the rest. So, the, the topic is not going to be then that resurrection. It's going to be something else. It's going to be based on a surah. Does anyone know of a surah in the Quran titled The Resurrection? And if so, do you know what that is in Arabic? And if so, can you give me the first ayah? All these questions are so tough, huh? Someone said? Surah Al-Qiyamah, MashaAllah. Sisters on point, brothers asleep. Sounds familiar? Yes. <laughs> Surah Al-Qiyamah, where does that fall in the Quran? Which juz? Juz 29. Who has it memorized? All right, I see two hands, three hands. Good enough, Mr. Okay, if my son doesn't have it memorized, something's wrong. 
Surat Al-Qiyamah can be translated easily as the resurrection. Of course, Qiyamah from Qama Yaqumu. Qiyam has to do with when you pray night, night prayer. In Ramadan, we call it Qiyam. صح? And Qama meaning to stand up, to rise. And in that particular context, it is to resurrect after death. The whole thing revolves around resurrection after death. Because every soul shall taste death. So in the Quran and Surah Al-Qiyamah, uh, there are hundreds of lessons. Now of course we know there are suwar which were revealed in Mecca and suwar which were revealed in Medina. And the topic and the content of these suwar were relevant to the condition of the Prophet peace upon him and his companions. In the events that they were going through in propagation of their religion, they had to deal with people from different backgrounds, different uh, mentalities, different cultures sometimes. And you had to communicate the message of Islam to everybody effectively. And a human being can fool around so much if he wants, really. But in the very core of every human being, the truth has its presence already, which we know as the fitrah, the natural disposition. The, the innate nature of mankind. They know deep down where the truth is. And they can successfully ignore it. They can success, successfully veil it. They can successfully pretend that it's not there. It's, it's something that humans are able to do. But it is in there. And when you communicate to it, it will react. It will react. That's why, and we see from other suwar that Allah, Allah already took that pledge from every human being. Alastu bi Rabbikum? Am I not you, Lord? Qalu bala. We all said yes. We take, we admit. So that you will not say on the day of judgment, lest you say on the on yawm al qiyamah, I was unaware of this. No one can come and say. No atheist can come and say. I really did not know there was a God. It's something that they decided to believe, but deep down, they know. And so these suwar speak to that innate nature where even if you're the most evil person, you're the biggest disbeliever, you're the most wicked of human beings, if that person listens attentively or decides to hear, not with the ears, but with the heart, these, these ayat will communicate with the heart. Afterwards, the person either responds and therefore Allah expands his chest to guidance, or that person ignores, and therefore Allah allows them to take that path. فَلَمَّا زَاغُوا أَزَاغَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ When they deviated, Allah let their hearts deviate. They made that choice. Not that it was not known to them. They made that choice. فَمَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَهْدِيَهُ يَشْرَحْ صَدْرَهُ الْإِسْلَامُ Whomsoever Allah wants to guide, He will expand His chest for Islam. But the person has to have some Sincerity. Listen with the ears. And then from the ears, listen with the heart. And see how the surah communicate with our very essence. That's why the Quran had this huge impact. And that's why that impact is only effective in Arabic. Now we could read the translation in English and it's going to be, I don't know, if we were to put a percentage on it, maybe 20% in terms of effectiveness, maybe even less. Because the impact of the Arabic words on those who understand it are beyond what I can interpret. Because it's the speech of Allah. It's the speech of Allah and we're merely conveying it to, to the rest. So, the surah begins after the ta'awwud and the basmala. La uqsimu biyawm al-qiyamah. La here, the, sh the shuyukh, the scholars of tafsir say this is not the la nafia. It is not the negating type of la. When you say no, I'm not going to go. This is the type of Negation. Nor is it an additional one which sometimes appears in the Arabic language. Rather, it is used to draw the attention of the people. And this is a very uh, eloquent approach. When you want to communicate with someone and you want to draw it, because let's say there are multiple people speaking. So you want to say something that makes you kind of stand out so that the person... The people want to see what you have to say next. They don't know what you're going to say next. But the choice, that first word you say, 
can be that which turns them off so they say, ah, I don't want to hear this again. Or it could be this, what is he going to say? So if some, just to give you an example, let's say as a speaker, I sat behind the table and said to you in the beginning of the lecture, no, no, no. How many of you would be very interested to know what is the no for? Maybe you want to leave, but you will stick around as long as possible, hoping you will know why in the world did I begin the lecture by saying no. What was I denying? What was I refusing? It, it, it creates a curiosity, which might have not existed if I said the traditional introduction. You understand? So the intent behind it is, pay attention, because this is unusual. So la is this type of expression here. Then the actual oath. أُقْصِبُ بِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ I, And Allah Azza wa Jal is making the oath by the day of resurrection. And of course we learned from previous lectures that human beings do not swear or do not make an oath by any, with anyone or by anyone's name except Allah. However, Allah makes an oath with whatever He wants amongst His creation. So we don't say, I swear by my mother, I swear by my father, I swear by my uncle, I swear by my mustache, for those who grow one, huh? amongst the fellow Arabs. They swear by everything. Next thing you know is shoelaces. Not a good idea. So we don't, make, we don't swear by anything. We don't make an oath by anything except by Allah. However, Allah Azza wa Jal makes an oath with whatever He will. So here, Allah Azza wa Jal made an oath by Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And Yawm Al-Qiyamah, is that concept, as we said, of resurrection after death. And the people going out of their graves, and then all of them will be in that position, in that stance, where they are awaiting the judgment. And that is a difficult part. If everybody got out of the grave and it was straight you know, to paradise or straight to hell, maybe that would be somewhat easier, right? If you took an exam, which is easier? Let's say you take an exam, and then as soon as you submit the result, they give you the, as soon as you submit the exam, they give you the result. Is that easy? It's easy. But when they tell you the results are in two weeks, for two weeks you're going crazy, right? You, even if you knew you were failing, let me know I'm failing from, from the first minute. Khalas, I will deal with it, I will take it. The worst part is when you wait for two weeks and then you fail. Ah, oh, no. Seriously? That was agonizing. So you see how everything, if you, give the, if you find the right example, anything from the religious point of view will make perfect sense when we try to relate it to our daily lives. If we don't make this connection, that's when we find people divorced from the spiritual text. Oh, I don't understand, oh, it's too complicated, I don't relate to the Qur'an. Because we don't think of worldly examples that are very much relevant. So now everyone's standing, Resurrected from the grave, but nothing yet. Nothing yet. And of course, as it comes in the narrations, 50,000 years. The people will be standing for 50,000 years, and the sun will be very, it will be drawn near to their heads, a distance of a mile, according to some of the narrations. Whether the mile is this stick that is in the mascara, if, if what we can call it, you know, al, al kuhul or the one mile, the standard mile versus kilometer. That's pretty close. And then they will seek shafa'a, they will seek intercession from the prophets, and as we said, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him will intercede with Allah only that the, that the judgment begins. This is all a prelude for the judgment to begin. So, resurrection, then judgment. That, that time between the two will be very difficult for those who did not utilize the purpose of life. And it will be very pleasant for those who utilized the purpose of life. As it comes in the narrations, for the believer who had fulfilled the requirements of the Creator, it will be like the time between Dhuhr and Asr. Under the shade. Under the shade of Allah. Under the shade of the throne of Allah as it comes in some of the narrations. Just relaxing. For the rest, it will be something completely different. So, what we do now determines where we stand then. Can you imagine the vast difference between someone in the shade for a duration of Dhuhr to Asr, which is a, what, a few hours, versus 50,000 years under the sun? Big difference. Still sleeping for Fajr? 
Think again. وَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِالنَّفْسِ اللَّوَامَ Again, the same law. And Allah swore or made an oath by a nafs, oneself, اللَّوَامَ from لَوْم. What is لَوْم? Blame. The blaming self. Right? Now, each person, each one of us, has a blaming self. Whether you are good, whether you are 50-50, or whether you are bad, or I am bad for this matter, each one has a nafs al is one aspect of your soul, one aspect of your essence. We have a nafs al-ammara bisu, the one that commands evil. That's always there. Even in Ramadan, huh? That's always there. That's why people manage to disobey Allah in Ramadan. Even though the, the major devils are chained, you still wind up falling into some sort of error. People, you know, knocking each other out at the full and tamiz queue. Really? Busting up the whole fasting of the day for two riyals full and tamiz. It's crazy. It happens every year. And, and you see it. People double park, triple park. The dude leaves the car in the middle of the road, man. It's like, I don't care if no one makes it to iftar. As long as I got my full and tamiz. So finally now the police are actually managing this and they try to give tickets, alhamdulillah, it's about time so that you know you can make it to your uh, invitation on time and you won't be disturbed by the Garmushi and the uh, Abu Zain, Abu Zaid, Abu Yazid, what was it? Abu Zaid, sorry I'm not an expert, we usually eat at that other spot. طيب. So an nafs al-lawama then is the one that all frequently blames oneself and that is for the good believer, it blames him for shortcomings. So when one of us has shortcomings and you, you speak to yourself, why am I not as good? Why am I falling short? Why don't I pray this? Why don't I do that? This is actually a nafsul lawama. Blaming us for shortcomings. That's good. And when we sin, it blames us for sinning. Why did you do this? You know that this is wrong. You know the consequences. So this is an nafs al So Allah Azza wa Jal made an oath by the reward and the recompense and then the outcome. All of these are in this these two ayat. لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة. Now the answer. This is the oath. So what is the oath about? Because there's al qasam and jawab al qasam. The the response or the result of this qasam. أَيَحْسَبُ الْإِنسَانُ أَلَّنْ نَجْمَعَ عِظَامَهُ Does a human being think that we will not be able to gather his bones? We will not be able to bring him back together. To reassemble him, in other words. And this is basically a refutation to certain people who claim that there will be no resurrection. Or those who came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, huh? And uh, that one person who brought him uh, uh, a decayed bone and he told him, Ya Muhammad, O oh Muhammad, do you claim that your Lord is going to bring this decayed bone back to a human being? Fully functioning human being? So what did Allah reveal? In Surah Yaseen, قَالَ مَنْ يُحِي الْعِظَامَ وَهِيَ رَمِيمٌ قُلْ يُحِيَهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَاهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً okay, This is such a simple thing. Who will bring the bones back after they decayed? The one who created it the first time. Durr. You know how simple that is? Which is more difficult? For you to make something from scratch? Or to make it? Huh? Unassemble it and reassemble it? Which one is more difficult? The first. Because you have to figure so many things out. So if you manage to make it from scratch, certainly... Being able to put it back together for whatever reason, if it winds up breaking, is much easier than the, the former, which requires a lot of thinking, a lot of you know, dedication, so on and so forth. So you're looking at this bone and you're saying, is God is going to be able to? Is God going to be able to bring this back? Well, of course. He made it the first time when it was nothing. He made it from nothing. And now you're wondering whether he can bring it back. It's pretty strange that the people will make that Type of, you know, uh, uh, assumption that Allah cannot bring them back. 
بلا قادرين على أن نسوي بنانة Who knows what, what banana means? No, no, guys. No, I'm serious. No, one of Allah, I'm not playing. When it comes to, and I'm very particular about these things. And I, I was worried, I should have thought of this. When it comes to these issues, there's no jokes. Seriously. Like this can never be, don't use this as a type of joking. Because some people try to use the Quran for, I'm not going to give you other examples, but that's a no-no. Okay? That was an unintentional, I actually said banana with the ha, but maybe some of you didn't hear it. Nevertheless, uh, what is the banana? Fingertips? Fingertips? You're using the, the phone? This is a violation of the law, Ya Adil. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not refer to your phones when I ask you questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can write a book about this. It'll be a bestseller, inshallah. So, uh, then the, <laughs> the ayah says, Verily, we're able to bring back, huh, in proportion, his fingertips. Now, of course, you know nowadays with the modern technology, whether you're traveling, huh, you have the what? The basma. The basma. And phones, generally now, modern phones have, again, the basma, the fingerprint, as a very secure method of locking and unlocking your phone, as one example. And in jawazat, when traveling, is it possible that you put your fingerprint and they mistake you for someone else? Can you have a twin brother and then have identical fingerprints? So this is something unique, right? Allah Azza wa Jalla, and this is amazing, if you think about it, it's mind-boggling. I mean, how, how can it be that everyone has, even though if you look at your fingers, the thumb for example, I mean, they all look the same, there's a bunch of lines, right? Nothing really, you know, it's not like everyone has his own map, or different type, it's just really standard looking fingers. Everybody's looking at their finger now. It's not like you're going to find anything. You could do this at home. So, I mean, how could this be? How can it be, and, and this is one of the miraculous natures of the Qur'an. Because maybe someone said, okay, what's the, what's, what makes the fingerprint, uh, you know, the fingertip different than anything else? Now we understand. If Allah is able to bring back that human being with that unique identity that is found in his fingertips, then that's a big deal. That's a big deal from a miraculous point of view. Verily, we're able to bring back the, in proportion... His fingertips. And the Shaykh, Rahimahullah, Shaykh Abdul Rahman Nasr al Saadi said, uh, So whoever then claims that if Allah, if, if he, whoever denies that Allah Azza wa Jal is able to do so, then obviously he has denied resurrection altogether. Because all these are a one package. And as we know, when it comes to the tenets of faith, they are a single package. You cannot. Divide it and say, okay, I'm going to believe in angels, but um, the prophets thing, I'm not really sure about it. I never met any prophet. No prophet came and spoke to me directly. Therefore, I, I hold back. I would believe in angels. I would believe in God. I would believe in scriptures, but I would not believe in prophets. We say, it doesn't fly. Or someone says, I will believe in everything except scriptures. Or all the scriptures except that one scripture. Or all the prophets except one prophet. Or all the angels except one angel. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's a contract that you're signing with a company. And when you sign a contract with a company, you go by all the rules. You cannot say, I will sign the contract. However, I will come two hours late every day, leave two hours early, and you will pay me triple what the contract says. You cannot stipulate now a bunch of conditions. If you would like to do so, don't sign a contract. Now, once you've signed a contract, you take the whole package. What, what, whatever's in it for you and whatever's against you. But in the tenets of faith, there's nothing against you, really. You have no alternative anyways except to believe in everything which came from Allah. That means you believe in Allah. وَمَلَائِكَتِي All the angels of Allah. وَكُتُبِهِ All the scriptures Allah revealed, which are what? Who knows the scriptures Allah revealed? Mr. Lintag. Name one scripture Allah, God revealed. The Torah of Moses. Sir? The Injil, the gospel of Jesus. 
Do we have any of these two, by the way? Has anyone ever seen the Gospel of Jesus? No. Have you seen the Torah of Moses? No. The Quran? The Suhaf of Ibrahim? Huh? The scriptures of Ibrahim and the Suhaf of Musa. Some of the scholars say these are the Torah as well. And the, the Zabur of Dawood, السلام, the Psalms of David. These are scriptures Allah revealed. So, and from among them, the only one that is preserved, intact, unchanged, not a single word added, not a single word removed, is the Quran. Only. The other ones, we don't even have. The Bible is a compilation of books written by many different people. Luke, John, Mark, Matthew, Paul, some of the remnants of the Old Testament with the New Testament, then we have different versions of that same Bible, depending on whether the person is Catholic or Protestant, discrepancy in the number of books, 66 verses 73, and the list goes on. And you will find that they revise, remove, add, change. All these things are facts. So we, we don't have the Gospel of Jesus or the Torah of Moses, but we do have the Quran, which commands us to believe in all of those. So you have to believe in all the tenets of faith to be a true believer. Then Allah said, بَلْ يُرِيدُ الْإِنسَانُ لِيَفْجُرَ أَمَامَهِ يَسْأَلُ أَيَّانَ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ What does that mean? Just to give you the English. So the English equivalent more or less is, but man desires to continue in sin. That's why لِيَفْجُرَ What is Fajara, because you know the, the Arabic language is very interesting because you have Fajr, right? And you have Fajr, صح? and then you have Mutafajr, but we don't want to go there, right? So, but all these words have to do with the idea of some sort of explosion or something coming out of something, that's why it's called Fajr, right? It's from going from, from dark to dawn, that, you know, that morning, that's fujur. And then fujur is also when someone goes overboard in sinning. That's why a person who's extremely sinful, they say he is a fajr. So that's a, a high level of sinfulness, which is complete heedlessness from the truth and from guidance. So man desires to continue in sin. He asks, when is the day of resurrection? The justification which we give ourselves is, Come on, that's a long time from now. I'll become 50 years old, do hajj, repent to Allah, khalas. Then I will retire, sit at home, and read Quran every day. Maybe that's what some of us say to, to themselves. Let's hope the battery is, is still full. That's what we might say to ourselves. I'm still young. Huh? Let me live the life. Let me enjoy myself. Then when I become old, I'll figure it out. That's one attitude. The, the other attitude is, there is no resurrection. And that is what the atheists today push. And the only way they're able to continue to sin with a peace of mind, if I may say, the only way a person can sin without feeling that guilt feeling is by saying there's no resurrection. Because that means there's no accountability. And if there's no accountability, then I do what I want. If you went to a school, you attended some sort of school, and they told you, look, cheating is halal. There's no principle for the school, there's no law in the school, there are nothing, there's nothing. No one is going to see you during the exam cheating and say, hey, look at your own paper, or give you a zero. N nothing. It's totally fine to cheat. Then, would the person cheat or remain sincere? Most people will cheat. How does a person reach that point when they know there's no accountability? If you knew that if you were to cheat and be caught, you would be given a zero, we say, yeah, wait a second now. It's not worth it. So the way they justify it is by saying there's no resurrection. Then Allah told us how things are going to be. فَإِذَا بَرِقَ الْبَصَرِ So when vision is dazzled, وَخَسَفَ الْقَمَرِ And the moon darkens. 
وَجُمِعَ الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ And the sun and the moon are joined. يَقُولُ الْإِنسَانُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ أَيْنَ الْمَفَرُ Man will say on that day, where is the place of escape? Huh? After it's too late. Now let's see what the Sheikh says in commenting on these ayat. Sheikh Abd Rahman Nasir Saadi Rahimahullah. He said in regards to the, the moon, when it darkens, meaning they will be the, the authority that the moon currently has will be gone. And the light of the moon will be gone. And the moon has significance in, in the lives of human beings. And I'm not speaking about vampires, right? Or you know, people who become wolves or whatever, you know, superstitious beliefs that people have. We're talking about in modern, uh, rational human beings. The moon uh, plays a role in the lives of human beings. How often do people like to go out to some desert area only to look at the moon? Or to look at the stars? And you know, when, when a husband wants to flirt with his wife, he will say that you, Qamar, you like a Qamar, you like a moon. You're more beautiful than a moon. This is only for married couples, huh? You may not use this out of context. وَجُمِعَ الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرِ The Sheikh said, وَهُمَا لَمْ يَجْتَمِعَا مُنْذُ خَلَقَهُمُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى The sun and the moon have never come together since created. Since they were created, they have never been joined together. But on the day of resurrection, Allah Azza wa Jal will bring the sun and the moon together. Huh? And then the sun, تُكَوَّرُ الشَّمْسُ وَيُخْسَفُ الْقَمَرِ then they will be, the, the sun will be become rounded, it will be like from taqweer. It will become rounded. Then both of them will be cast into the hellfire. So these are from the signs of the last day, or once it's all said and done actually, not even the signs. In the aftermath of the last day. The sun and the moon will be brought together and they will be cast, they will be dumped into the hellfire. لِيَرَ الْعِبَادَ أَنَّهُمَا عَبْدَانِ مُسَخَّرًا وَلِيَرَ مَنْ عَبَدَهُمَا أَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا كَاذِبِينَ Why is that? Because a lot of people worship the sun and the moon. A lot of people have taken them as objects of worship. A lot of the modern religions, if you look at their ideology and some of the dogmatic beliefs, you will find that it is actually traced from some sort of Paul, uh, is some, you know, from, from the polytheistic idea of worshipping the sun and the moon and so on and so forth. A lot of paganism, in other words, is involved. And we know that when Ibrahim was given da'wah to his people, what did he say? When he saw the sun, the sun and the moon, he said, Qala hadha, hadha Rabbi. Because he was speaking to the people according to their intellect. They took these as objects of worship. So he said, this must be my God. Then when it disappeared, he said, huh, I don't like those who disappear. He used this as a means of showing the people that these objects of worship you're worshipping are deficient. And this is a lesson for every human being. Anything other than God which the people deify is deficient and is dependent on you. How can you then depend on it? When you bring a statue of any type of God, any type of God in the minds of the people, and among the Buddhists, if it's Buddha, among the Hindus, some Shiva or Brahma or any one of these gods, or a, a Virgin Mary or Jesus or whatever, any type of uh, idol, idol or a statue that resembles a god that the people show devotion to, who needs who? Who maintains who? Did you make this or did it make you? Did the statue create us? No, who created it? We did. Went to some store, went to some artist, say, here's some tools, come on now, carve one for me. Who maintains it, cleans it? We do. Who entered it into the place of worship? Who relocates it? We do. We do full maintenance of this object, and then we want it to do things for us? That's amazing. That's amazing. Amazing logic. And so we learn... This can never be the case. The one who deserves worship is the one who is maintaining you. You don't maintain him. Who's maintaining your eyesight and your thinking and your heartbeat and your blood flow and your sustenance and every single move? Allah, the creator, the creator 
All of these things are like us. In fact, we are better than them. We are better than them. They're nothing but idols. And so idolatry, idol worshipping, has been the enemy of every prophet. And human beings are bent on worshipping idols. And they will remain like this until the end of time. They will not give up. They love them so much. But we are told to understand. That's why Ibrahim used this methodology. So, you worship the sun and the moon? Fine. Here. They'll be brought together, thrown into the hellfire. Now what? So now you're going to call on them to admit you to paradise? It's not going to work? Why? They don't have the authority. They never had the authority. So the Yaqul al-Insan, حِينَ يَرَى تِلْكَ الْقَلَاقِ للمزعجات, When the human beings are seeing these wild things, he will say, hey, how can I run away from this now? How can I escape? And it'll be too late. كَلَّا لَا وَزَرْ أَيْ لَا مَلْجَأَ لِأَحَدٍ دُونَ اللَّهِ No, there will be no escape. The only escape one will have is Allah. And to escape to Allah on the day of judgment, you have to do what? Sign a contract now. Regardless of your age, regardless of your background, regardless of your religion, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your everything, everything is irrelevant. If somebody wants to refer to God on that day for some sort of salvation, it has to begin now. The contract has to be signed now. It's not a contract that somebody gives you a piece of paper and you sign your name. No, that's not what I mean. You know what I mean. Because if you don't have it, then on that day when you say, okay, all of these other objects of worship are gone. They cannot help me now. And even those among human beings who will worship, they will declare their innocence from their worshipers. And amazingly, you know, th- th- we have references from the Bible about this. Jesus will be telling the people, get away from me. Get away from me. And they will call him, you know, Lord, Lord. And he will refuse. He will refuse. Anyone who has taken anything as an object of worship on the day of judgment, it will come to an end. So, fail. Huh? You have ba- plan B, right? You have a backup plan. If you want your backup plan to be Allah, it's not going to work. Why? Because Allah is never a backup plan. It is the only plan that will work. This is why it is necessary that each and every one of us has this relationship. Has this relationship. At what degree? This is where we vary. Some have it at a high degree. They're extremely close to their creator. They're devout worshippers. They're obedient. May Allah bless them and make us among them. And some are hanging in there. And some are in the, uh, the, the beginning of the road. But we have to be somewhere there. Even if one of us is on the beginning of the road and he dies, he's still in good hands. It will benefit him. No matter what will happen, Allah's mercy is vast. His forgiveness is vast. Way more than we imagine. More, way more than we even think. That's why the rahmah, which we see from Allah, is only one of one hundredth. Of Allah's Rahma, right? Allah sent down only one out of one hundred. Rahma, which we, we human beings are sharing. So the mother shows mercy to her kids, her babies, through that one Rahma. And 99 of those Allah saved for the day of judgment. Alhamdulillah. Because if that weren't the case, we would be in big trouble. But you know, we have to do something to earn it. Now we have to be on, on the right track. So Allah Azza wa Jal said, إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ يَوْمَئِذٍ الْمُسْتَقَرْ This reaffirms the previous ayah. So only to Allah Azza wa Jal will be the final, uh, the, the everlasting you know, end. That, that's where it is. To Allah Azza wa Jal will be the, with the place where you'll be fixed. يُنَبَّعُ الْإِنسَانُ يَوْمَئِذٍ بِمَا قَدَّمَ وَأَخَرِ It's all fair and square. The human being will be informed on that day of everything he put forth and everything he did. Whatever, you ha- whatever we have done in our lives, it will be told. This is extremely fair. Because today, we don't get this type of treatment. Today you may be sacked for something that you didn't do. 
or someone will do something to you to hold you accountable and never tell you the whole thing. Or they may hide some things that are for you and make them against you. You don't get treated fairly in this life because there are always hidden elements. But on the day of judgment, everyone will be told, look, here's what you have done. And it's all recorded in a book. And the angels wrote it down. And then our own limbs, huh? will testify against us. Oh, how are we going to escape? Right? The hands will speak. The feet will speak. The eyes will speak. Everything will speak. You did this, you did that. Oops. Can't hide. Can't deny. You can't say it wasn't me. You have all these evidences against you and it's all being said to your face. So no one can come and pretend that they were wronged on the Day of Judgment. Allah will not wrong anyone. وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا Your Lord does not wrong anyone. So we will know. That's why Allah said, بَلِ الْإِنسَانُ وَعَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرًا Rather the human being, he's, he knows himself. Basira is what? To see. But not just a regular vision from Basar. Basira is actually a step ahead. That's why you say, we, we learn from the ayah in the Qur'an, قُلْ هَذِي سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرًا Say, this is my path, I call to Allah upon Basira. Basira is not just seeing, it's, it's knowledge. So the human being knows, not only we see, we, all, we also know ourselves. We have self-accountability, which we cannot escape from. وَلَوْ أَلْقَى مَعَذِيرًا That's an amazing ayah. Even if he gave many excuses. Because we give a lot of excuses. Yeah, because of this and that. And we try to justify ourselves the wrongdoing which we do. Every one of us is guilty of that in one way or another. At least speaking about myself. We're guilty of that. Eh, Make it halal somehow. We justify it. But we know deep down it's wrong. Even if we gave these excuses, it's wrong. You can give an excuse to someone by lying and get away. Right? Your boss can tell you, how come you didn't do A, B, C? So, no, no, I did it. Something along these lines. And then you go do it later. And you tell him that you did it two days before. You can get away with it. You can come up with something and escape. But can you lie to your own self? Can you ever lie to your own self really sincerely? And then you get shocked later by yourself that you lied? No way. It's just all known. We can read our own thoughts. So the Sheikh said, فَإِنَّهَا مَعَاذِيرٌ لَا تُقْبَلْ وَلَا تُقَابَلْ مَا يُقَرِّرُ بِهِ الْعَبْدِ فَيَقِرُّ بِهِ So these excuses will not be accepted and then it will not be what will determine that person's final destination, his excuses. And rather he would admit, كَمَا قَالَ تَعَالَى اِقْرَأْ كِتَابَكَ كَفَى بِنَفْسِكَ الْيَوْمَ عَلَيْكَ حَسِيبًا Read your own book. Sufficient is you as a witness against yourself. So imagine in the court of law, huh? you say, Your Honor, I testify against myself. I committed the crime. No one else was there to see you. You become a witness against your own self and say, I committed the crime, basically telling them, put me in jail. Had you lied, and there were no witnesses, like right now, the current law in so many countries, if there were no witnesses, even if you committed the crime, they may not be able to sack you. You can get away. The system has loopholes. A good Jewish lawyer, he'll get you out. Yeah, that's, that's how it works in some countries. He will get you out. Depending on the wasta connection, so on and so forth, a lot of elements are involved. But when you say, I'm going to witness against myself, it's done. And so, this is our condition at all times when it comes to our relationship with our Creator. The Sheikh said, so the human being, even if he denies or he apologizes, that will not be of any benefit because he will have his eyesight and his hearing and all of his limbs bear witness against him or her. Then we shift. And this is one of the miraculous natures of the Qur'an. The shifting in topic. So while we were, now Allah Azza wa Jal brought the attention of the Bedouin Arabs back then to this very important fact. 
because they used to see the sun all the time, they used to see the moon all the time, they sure were familiar with their fingers, right? These are things that are relatively close. So Allah Azza wa Jal used things that they are familiar with to in, inform them that you cannot hide. You can deny now, but you will be accountable on the day of judgment. So now Allah Azza wa Jal speaks to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He says, لا بِهِ لسانك لتعجل به. Uh, the Shaykh said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi whenever Jibreel will come and, and bring the revelation, he will try to recite simultaneously or right after Jibreel. He was afraid he would forget some of the revelation. So Allah Azza wa Jal told him not to recite with Jibreel, rather to wait until Jibreel has done and then he repeats afterwards. And Allah Azza wa Jal gave the Prophet the ability to memorize. Because we remember the Prophet ﷺ was illiterate. He was illiterate. He was unable to read nor write. So naturally someone who doesn't have these skills may require more in terms of, in order to be able to memorize. Because if you read and write, then your mind is also trained, right? Those who memorize a lot, they have a better memory than those who don't. Try to memorize in the Quran. Once you've memorized four or five just you find memorizing 25 other Jews is, is pretty feasible. But if you're struggling with two or three surahs, memorizing the whole Quran seems like mission impossible. So, you know, it, it, you train your mind for certain things. So then he was told not to worry about that. Inna alayna jama'ahu wa Qur'ana. Allah Azza wa said, it is upon us to, to gather, to collect the Quran and the recitation. And that promise that Allah Azza wa Jal gave to the Prophet Sallallahu we are the fulfillment of that promise today. Was the Quran gathered in a single book? Sure. Do we hear it recited all the time? All over the world. All over the world, we hear, the world, we hear the recitation of the Quran from our parents, from our children, from our relatives, from the neighbors, from the imam of the masjid. Anywhere you go, you hear the book of Allah being recited. This is the fulfillment of Allah's promise. فَإِذَا قَرَأْنَاهُ فَاتَّبِعْ قُرْآنَ Meaning after we recite, then you follow the recitation and you repeat after Jibreel. ثُمَّ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا بَيَانَهَ أَيْ بَيَانُ مَعَنِيهِ So Allah Azza wa Jal did not only preserve the wording, the verbatim of the Qur'an, He also preserved the meaning of the Qur'an. This is why until now, we know the meanings of the ayat of the Qur'an based on the explanation of the companions of the Prophet So, and especially the ambiguous ayat, or the ayat which are open to multiple interpretations. We already have the, the decision and the conclusion of the Sahaba in regards to these particular ayat. So the Prophet وسلم, he obeyed Allah's command, and he followed those instructions. So he would wait for Jibreel to finish recitation, then he would recite afterwards. Now we shift to another topic. So if someone was wondering, what's up? Why? What's up, huh? It's ironic that I said that because that's going to be very relative to what I'm saying right now. If we're wondering how come there's some, you know, some sort of confusion, it is really because of our choices. Why is it that the Quran does not hold the status it's supposed to hold in our heart because of our preoccupation with everything else? So Allah said, كَلَّا بَلْ تُحِبُّونَ الْعَاجِلَ Nay, but rather you love the what? Al-Ajila. What is Al-Ajila? The immediate, the fast-moving life, hastiness, however you want to define it, it's referring to what? This worldly life. Because this worldly life, in comparison to eternity, is it... Long or short? It's very short. Is it quick or, or, or long? It is very quick. You spend 50, 60, 70 years, ya Sheikh, 80 years, and then you're gone. And after you're gone, there's eternity. Eternity. There's no end anymore. Either in hellfire for eternity or in paradise for eternity. So what is this worldly life compared to the life to come? Ajila. Which we love. Right or wrong? We do. Is it haram? Is it wrong to enjoy life? Can anyone say that in Islam it's not permitted for you to enjoy life? 
it's halal? Uh huh. Yes, sir. We have to qualify. If we loved it to the extent of becoming or thinking that this is it, we don't have any preparation for the life to come, then we're on the wrong track. But if our focus is the life to come, and until we arrive there, we utilize whatever Allah made lawful, it's all good. Because that was the demeanor of the Prophet and his companions. If that was not permissible, why would anyone get married? Right? There would be no point in getting married. There would be no point in having children. There would be no point in doing business. All of these things, the Sahaba did extensively. Extensively. In fact, Umar would miss out on the companionship of the Prophet ﷺ due to his engagement in his business. So he would alternate with another companion who would spend time with the Prophet ﷺ when he was doing business, then they will take turns and relate to each other what they learned from their company of the Prophet. Can you imagine a Sah- Umar radiallahu anhu wa arda, and may Allah guide anyone who mentions him in anything that is negative, evil or deficient? Do you, can you imagine him not knowing certain things of the deen? No way, Jose. He understood who the Prophet was, alayhi salatu salam, and he also understood the objective of life. And his main, main focus was on the life to come, yet he utilized what Allah Azza wa Jal made lawful. Islam does not want you to live on a mountain and pray until you die. It does not want you to do that. In fact, that is un-Islamic, least to say. Even though some now claim to be a, a way of, of, of living, it's not a an, an standard way of living in Islam. So, Allah said, you love then the hasty life. And this is what, ha- this is what has made you heedless. The, ha- the worldly life has made you heedless. And I'll just give you an example. Let's be honest with each other. Don't burn yourself out and raise your hand or anything of the sort. But how many of us say the adhkar of the morning and the adhkar of the evening? Don't answer, it's okay. Keep it a secret between you and Allah. The adhkar of the morning and the evening, somehow we don't have time, right? If you ask most people, say, Wallah, I know them, I haven't memorized. Ya akhi, Wallah, I don't have time. But then you look at their WhatsApp, MashaAllah, they had plenty of time. Huh? Isn't it amazing that someone will send you 18 faces? Like they, one face with the, one with the tear, and one with the I don't know what, then a heart, then this, then two people dancing. How long does it take to choose, you know, go through all the, I know them, by the way, to go through all the options of the different tabs, to choose all these icons, just to deliver a message. How long does that take? Take some time. Even if they are the recent ones which you use often, it still takes some time. So how many nonsensical messages were sent? Plenty. Taib. We're doing that anyways, may Allah guide us. Couldn't you have squeezed some time for the adhkar of the morning, ya sheikh? Come on now. I mean, this is what we're talking about. We're living in this life. Some people are always bothered. Yeah, the m- human beings, the, f- the funniest thing in the world is when someone sends you this, you know, on, if you use Facebook, they send you something on Facebook or on YouTube that, you know, uh, a story of how human beings are so engaged with their phones, right? And that you need to drop this phone, right? Drop this phone, enough already. And then the funny thing is you're watching it on your phone. It's like, okay, I'll drop the phone, so... Wait a second, I won't even get the message. Now, how did you make it? My, you were sitting there on the computer, you brought it on your phone. So this whole idea that the people are trying to push now is that you completely ditch the technology and you go back, you know, a few hundred years with this old Abu Bissa phone, you know, that can only call someone. is is not really something that is necessarily intelligent. What we need is time management. What we need is using our brains. It's okay, Akhi. Use your phone in a halal way. Use WhatsApp and other applications for, for goodness, for reminders, for spreading of Islam, whatever. Even non-religious matters that are lawful. Go ahead, ya Akhi. But don't become so immersed in it that you don't have time to give two minutes for the adhkar of the morning or the adhkar of the evening. You understand what I mean? 
These are the basic things which we can agree to. So we don't want to go to either extremes. So then you love the ajila, وَتَذَرُونَ akhira. And on the flip side, after you love this worldly life so much, you abandon the life to come. You don't want to think about it. Think about it, it's too much, too much worry, too much headache, too much preparation. Let me just, let me just enjoy this worldly life. This is the worst disease that can afflict the heart. We speak about diseases, an illness for the, for the physical body, ah, that's manageable. You take some painkillers, you get an operation, whatever, you can manage. But a disease to the heart, who's going to cure it? Huh? Which doctor in this hospital or elsewhere is going to cure it? You go to the best doctor in the world. Ya Sheikh, I have a disease in my heart. Not a heart disease for the physical heart, but an issue of this sort. Which doctor is going to give you? Say, hey, take some Panadol, inshallah, tomorrow you'll be a mindful of Allah. <laughs> yeah, right. That doesn't work. Now that requires effort on our part. No human being can get involved. There's something between us and Allah, Azza wa Jal. Which boils down to not being so attached to the worldly life with being so heedless about the life to come. So we give Allah Azza wa Jal His rights. It's just about prioritizing. And when we prioritize, Allah Azza wa Jal and His rights are the foremost and the most important thing and everything else comes second. If it should come at all. Now what happens on that day? Wujuhun yawma idhin nadira. There will be faces on the day of judgment illuminating, glowing. Huh? Why? Ila rabbiha nadira. These faces will be glaring at their Lord. And that is the evidence which we use that the believers will see Allah on the last day. Because the ayah explicitly said, إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرًا They will be looking and gazing at Allah Azza wa Jal. Whom we have not seen. Whom no human being has seen. Musa, alayhi salam, made an attempt. Declined. It was declined. قَالَ رَبِّ أَرِنِي أَنظُرْ إِلَيْكَ قَالَ لَنْ تَرَانِي My Lord, allow me to gaze at you. Allah said, you will not be able to see me. No one can see Allah Azza wa Jal in this worldly life. But in the life to come, explicit. إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرًا They will, will be glazing at Allah Azza wa Jal. وَوُجُوهٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ بَاسِرًا تَظُنُّ أَنْ يُفْعَلَ بِهَا فَاقِرًا Basira is a frowning face. So while some faces will be smiling and glowing, there will be faces that will be frowning and sad. It will be worried about some serious punishment that will be awaiting it. So basically, uh, you have a big wave coming, a huge wave, and you have two people standing. One is a surfer, who waits for these waves. This, this, is his, this is his sport. So he's like, yes, the wave I've been looking forward to ride is coming. He's all happy and excited about it. And right next to him is someone who doesn't know how to swim. He sees the same wave and he's like, oh no, I'm dead. Because he doesn't know how to swim. So once the wave comes, khalas, it's over. So these are two people standing, seeing the same thing. However, they are in complete opposites. One is looking forward, anticipating, happy that the wave is coming. This is his day. And the other one is like, this is my day to die. Looking at the same wave. Again, this is just a, the kid likes the example, which is good. This is just a minor example to show you how could it be that we have such differences. On the, day, on the last day, it's much greater than that. So they will be worried about the punishment. So Allah describes, okay, before that, let's go back to the last moments before someone dies. So Allah said, كَلَّا إِذَا بَلَغَتِ التَّرَاقِي أو التراقية, uh, And this is uh, basically the moment of death. The moment of death and uh, when the soul reaches the collarbone. Huh? So at that very moment, it's over. And uh, I, I, there's some videos which I've seen on, on YouTube. I don't know if some of you have seen them. Uh, some of them have music in the background. Other ones have Quran playing in the background showing the death of soccer players on the soccer pitch. On the soccer, it's, it's pretty wild. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's pretty wild. 
it shows you some, you know, football or soccer, whichever one you prefer to use, I don't care, uh, dying during the game. And it's just, it's wow, it's mind-blowing. Because you see the condition of that person, how they fall, how they collapse, and then some of them you see his actual eyes. You see his eyes opening and then he just sees his soul kind of leaving his body. It's, it's evident. You cannot miss it. You cannot escape it. And so this is a description of the person at that last moment when there's absolutely no escape. وَقِيلَ مَنْ رَكَ Now when the person is on his deathbed, he's about to die, the people around him start what? Panicking. They panic. And they will say, who can cure him? Who can give him ruqya? Huh? And I want to highlight something in, for, for those who use this term. Uh, sometimes when we try to write the English transliteration of ruqya, we wind up writing ruqya or something of the sort. or ruqya. Don't confuse the two. Okay, because that's someone's name. The actual word is ruqya. So if you want to spell it, it should be R-U-Q, right? Y-H maybe, Y-A-H, ruqya. Not ruqya or ruqya, so you put double Q, double Y, uh, other words. These are two different words, don't confuse them. It's ruqya, which is that spiritual remedy. So they will say man raq, because now there's, there's no, uh, no, help, no hope. There's no hope in anything. وَظَنَّ أَنَّهُ الْفِرَاقِ And then that person knows, ظن here means he knows for certain, it's firaq meaning separation. This is the moment I'm going to leave my wife behind and my kids and my relatives. It's over. I'm shifting to the next life. Every human being will know that. At that moment, they will know. Because they saw seeing things from the life to come. They will see the malaika, right? The angels come and take their soul. إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ يَوْمَئِذٍ الْمَسَاقِ To your Lord on that day will be the return. So this is the moment when everyone knows whether they will be in good hands Meaning what comes after will be good, or what comes after will be worse. So for the believer who has been good, it's a peace of mind. Death is a peace of mind, if you think about it. Why? You're leaving behind all the agony of the world. This world of ours, no matter how pretty we try to make it look, it, at the end of the day, it's, it's full of agony, it's full of sadness. You never have continuous goodness from the time you're born until you die. It just doesn't happen. You have to face the death of loved ones, you have to face injuries, you have to face loss of money, you have to face loss of health. Something has to come to ruin the good times. It's just the way it is. So when a, and of course you have to worry about uh, finance and your family and your children behind, their well-being, their future, all these worries that you worry about while you're alive. When you're about to die, say like, khalas. For the believer, I don't have to worry about this stuff anymore. The kids... They're in Allah's hands. Allah will take care of them like He took care of me, like He's always been taking care of them. Anyways, it's not like you take care of your children. Allah takes care of your children through you. When you go away, Allah will take care of your, take care of your children through other means that Allah has made available, if He will. So you don't have to worry much about that. So what is the word concern here? Here's the part that we should be thinking about. So if we have done all this, what will make a person lose on that day? فَلَا صَدَّقَ وَلَا صَلَّ That person, a human being, had two defects. Number one, he didn't believe. He didn't believe in what he's supposed to believe in. وَلَا صَلَّ Nor did he pray. He didn't believe in Allah, His angels, the scriptures, the messengers, the last day, and the qadr, the good and the bad thereof. He didn't believe in the six pillars of faith. He didn't have them intact. وَلَا صَلَّ Nor did he pray. How many of our family members don't pray? This is one of the scariest ayat for those individuals. Tell them, call them on the phone. Send them a WhatsApp, ya akhi, since you're trying to save money. Tell them, Allah said in the Quran, فَلَا صَدَّقَ وَلَا صَلَّ He didn't believe nor did he pray. Why don't you pray? Look at the context of these ayat. Look what comes before and what comes after. وَلَكِنْ كَذَّبَ وَتَوَلَّى On the flip side, he lied and he turned. He turned away and he moved. No, no belief, no prayer, denying, I know it's the truth, but uh, not for me, not really. No way. No way. What kind of choice? I mean, the Quran is speaking to us. It's speaking to us to enlighten us. Didn't believe, didn't pray. Denied, walked away. 
you have yours, I have mine. Let's, let's be friendly. Let's love each other. Sure, then that's easy. I mean, anybody can do that. But then, on the day of judgment, we will say, wait. You know, what have I done? What choices have I made? And then it'll be too late. Because we learned from the previous ayat, it'll be too late. Not only that, then he went to his, his family, careless. Yatamatta is like always in, in arrogance and boastfulness. Ah, whatever. Awla laka fa'awla. Then Allah said some scary words. Woe to you. Then woe to you. Look. Awla laka fa'awla. Then what does the next ayah say? Thumma awla laka fa'awla. How many awlas are these? Four. So can you imagine, just to give you an example, and to Allah belongs the highest example. You're a troublemaker in class, and you give a hard time to the teacher, who's at the level of being a teacher. Then the teacher brings the principal of the school, who can, you know, make one phone call to your parents, and your life is over, technically. And then that principal comes to you and says, you know, if that was a term that we use in English now, Woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. You will fall apart right then and there. It's over. And that is a human being. At the end of the day, he can change his mind, right? Or you can have a wasta. You have a connection, your uncle knows his cousin, who knows his nephew, who knows his niece, who I don't know who knows who, couple of phone calls, nah, okay, khalas, mashi halak. All these woes, I said, cancel them out. You have been actually, you will get an A on your exams and you'll become, you know, the, 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 the teacher tomorrow. How did that happen? Yesterday he was the worst student. Mafi mushkila, his cousin knows my uncle, who knows my nephew, who knows my niece. We can fix him up. That's, a hum, that's human beings' business nowadays. But can you do that on the day of judgment? When the creator says to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, done. Not Jibreel, not Mikael, no prophet, no one can do anything about it. If that person reached that condition. So Allah said, أَيَحْسَبُ الْإِنسَانُ أَيُّتْرَكَ سُدَى Does the human being really think he'll be left alone? Do you really think there's no accountability? Hitler, Hitler, for example, to give an example is Hitler. Do you think Allah will create a world where someone like Hitler will manage to kill how many people? Does anyone have a figure? Because I don't have a figure. But maybe I can learn from you guys. Does anyone have a figure how many people died because of World War I and II and all that stuff? Anything Hitler was involved in? 50 to 60? Million? Ouch! I don't know. You can uh, cross-check this number later. But let's just say okay, half of that, a quarter of that. Yeah, I mean, let's say 100 people. 100 people, 100 people, meaning 100 individuals who had family members that were affected greatly by their death. And you were one person behind the killing of these people. Because of you, they died. Do you think it's fair that when you put in a grave, you and the one who gave charity all his life will be the same? There's nothing afterwards to fix this up? Compensation? Retribution? You who have wronged, killed a hundred people, come over here. It's time to pay because you may escape in this worldly life. Can you escape or can you not escape? What's the easiest thing for a killer? Suicide. Isn't that what we see? He shoots one, two, three, four. When the police come, psh, shoots himself. Get me now. Right? That's so annoying. I mean, it's irritating. If you've killed all these people, now that we want to hold you accountable for your death, you kill yourself, he's done. What are they going to do after? He beat him after he died? To make up for that, you can't do anything. It's done. It's, it's over. Subhanallah. It's amazing that someone can do collateral damage to thousands of human beings then, then just take their own soul it's over can't get me it's like teasing you nah, 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 he can't get me I'm gone <laughs> dead so the only way this can be fixed is if what if there's a day of judgment and there's recompense okay you killed all these people now you have to pay you can't escape you did good to all these people now you will be rewarded so it's a very logical question does a human being think there will be nothing There'll be no accountability, come on. Seriously, this world will be very unfair. And it is absolutely not logical that the Creator will do this. Alam min Was he not a, a, a drop from 
semen, sorry for being so graphic, but that's the, the, the words. These are the words of the Quran, which we have to really understand their implications. Meaning, a human being so arrogant, so boastful, you know, and then you came, we came from a sperm. It's pretty nasty. That's what we came from. So, how does something that was a drop of nastiness equivalent to mucus, if you want to compare to something equivalently nasty, huh? mucus, then you became bones and flesh and mind and all this, and now you want to reject your Lord? Come on! Oh, human being, did you forget where you came from? You came from this drop. I, your God, I made you. Your God speaking to us. I made you. Now you want to fight with me? Deny me, accept certain things, reject certain things, you know, Debate with, with the matters of faith? No way. So after he was nothing but a, a sperm drop, then he became a alaqa, which is a clot. Then Allah Azza created the human being and he fashioned him in the way we are. We're pretty amazing. Human beings are amazing. If you want to speak about beauty, you put a human being and a donkey, you tell me which one looks better. Human beings are amazing creatures. And Allah Azza wa Jal made us in this fashion. Regardless of the variation amongst us. It's Allah, and even among the rest of the creation, it's all Allah's proportional, very precise creation. And all of it came from a sperm. We all came from a sperm and look at the variation between us. It's pretty amazing if you think about it. So Allah made from both of us from the both, the male and the female. So the feminists cannot be upset. Because the Quran mentioned both male and female. The one who made all of this, is he able or is he not able to bring us back and resurrect us? Is he not able to give life to the dead? When he gave us life when we were dead? For sure. When one of us was still in his mother's womb. How did this soul come? Who gave us the soul that made us what we are? Allah. Is He able to bring us back after we died? Surely. So the surah began with Qiyamah and, deny, and those refuted, those who deny resurrection, those who deny Allah's ability to bring us back, and it ended. Remind us with the same message. That remember that Allah Azza wa is able to bring back the dead. Meaning don't forget the resurrection. So in conclusion, it's a very simple thing. There's a path which leads to salvation and that path we have to travel upon it. We may be at different stages, different levels. Some are advanced, some are in the middle, some are in the beginning of it. It does not matter where we stand, but there's only one path which we have to be on. All the other paths will lead somewhere else and will entail some of the threats which were mentioned in this particular surah and many other chapters in the Quran. So it's a reminder for myself and you to, to renew our relationship with Allah. We all know our shortcomings, our sins, our deficiencies, no issue. But it's always a reminder, let us start from scratch. Always focus on the last day. And then prioritize our lives accordingly. Hada wallahu alam wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anabiya Muhammad. Zakum la khair. Salam alaikum.